Tony Pierce, welcome to Partnering Leadership. I'm absolutely thrilled to have you in this conversation with me. Thanks for having me, Mahan. I really appreciate you doing these things. Tony, I have seen your leadership, not only of your own firm, but also your leadership in this community for the past couple of decades, really impactful. And we will get to that. But before we do, we'd love to know whereabouts did you grow up and how did your upbringing impact who you've become? Um, I am one of the few people in this town that can say they are a native Washingtonian. Um, I was born in Providence Hospital. Um, I won't say when, but a while ago. <laughs> Got a birthday coming up pretty soon. Um, and uh, I lived in a wonderful old neighborhood called River Terrace, which is over northeast. It's um, you can see you could see the RFK Stadium out of the um, my back bedroom window. When I was, um, I can't remember what year we moved out there, but. I went to high school, middle school, high school in Northern Virginia. My dad decided that the city wasn't going to be the best place for his two boys. So he packed the family up and we moved to a wonderful neighborhood in Northern Virginia called Greenbrier, which has a great history as it was one of the first um, integrated neighborhoods that the Levitt and Son family built in the South after Martin Luther King um, was assassinated. You may recall Levitt saying that after that, that he would never build segregated housing again. And Greenbrier in Northern Virginia in Fairfax County um, was one of those um, early neighborhoods that I think he started in 68 or 70. Um, and so I grew up mostly out in Northern Virginia, went to um, George Mason undergrad because um, I couldn't afford anywhere else and um, um, got into UVA, but my dad, my dad didn't want me to go there because uh, my brother had gone there and, and not done as well as he would have liked. Um, and then went to Georgetown Law School. So I am, I have been in DC all my personal and professional life and happy to, happy to have been, have done that. Yeah. And, and again, you have, you have deep roots in the region. Now in growing up, uh, you had a near-death experience when you were 12 years old. What happened then, Tony? Oh, well, so I was a, well, I'm not going to toot my own horn. Okay, I will. I was a phenomenal athlete. <laughs> and I was always on the all-star team. And um, baseball, um, baseball was my main sport. And um, this particular coach, uh would like always wanted us to kind of bond before the all-star game. Um, we would, we, you know, we'd play in our league and then we'd have an all-star team that played other leagues in Northern Virginia. And so I was the star pitcher, but to bond, the coach took us to a pool and I had a near drowning accident on the day of the game. Um, and, uh, was, was saved by a wonderful, um, Marine major who was our assistant coach, not the lifeguard. Um, and, um, I'm here to tell the story. So it was a, um, you know, it was an accident of course I was goofing around and got too much water and all that kind of stuff. But, um, that was my near death experience at 12 years old. Yeah, and fortunately, you survived that. And as you mentioned, you went to George Mason studying public administration. Did you always know you wanted to become an attorney? I did not. <laughs> okay. So I, I remember, I can remember this distinctly, um, writing on my college essays that, you know, they asked you like, what is your end, end goal? And I said, I wanted to be the city administrator of a major metropolitan city. And, um, and that got me into a bunch of schools and I took public administration. That's what I was gonna do. My mom was a teacher and my dad was a, a career um, civil servant in the Army Corps of Engineers, um, computer science, math, um, math major at Howard undergrad. Um, and so I always thought I was gonna end up working for the government. You know, you, you're, well, I'll tell you this story. When you, I don't know if your parents told you this, but my parents, they had their worldview. And to them, a job in the post office was like a really good job because you got a pension, right? So I wasn't thinking about being a lawyer at all. 
So when I was in the in undergrad, I said, hmm, I don't know that I'm going to the amount of money that's being made in this in this public administration stuff doesn't seem great. Uh, maybe I'll just apply to law school. So again, I wasn't certainly wasn't wealthy. So I knew I would have to go to law school at night. So I applied to go at night and I got a job at the general accounting office and I got into law school and I was like, well, I got in, I might as well go. So I went and I really, you know, I mean, I was a night student, so I didn't have, I didn't spend that much time in the school, but my evening division class was made up of people who had all uh, gone to work right after college. Not me. I had, I had gotten a job, but I went straight to law school, even though I had a job in the government during the day. And they were just some impressive people. Um, they just, you know, they worked on the Hill, they were journalists and I just, I, I enjoyed meeting all of them. And I said, okay, I'm going to stick with this. Uh, and then I thought I had a little bit of talent for litigating. So make a long story short, it was initially for the money, but now I get more enjoyment um, than just the money out. Yeah. And you obviously were smart enough to be able to make it to Georgetown Law and studying in the evenings, find that you both loved it, had a talent for it, and you have been great at it. But before we get back to law, uh, I know, and anyone that knows you, Tony, knows that you are a committed husband and family man. Your daughters and your wife, Karen, are really important to you. How did you meet Karen and why the heck did she agree to marry you? <laughs> <laughs> that, the, the, the second question, I don't really know the answer to. <laughs> uh, oh, that's a great story. So um, how do I tell the story? Well, let's, let's, let's say it this way. I had four tickets to every Bullets game. Now, that's how long ago this was. They were called the Bullets back then. And um, I used to always take a client and a significant other. Um, and I no longer, for reasons we won't discuss, I no longer had that. And I went to an associate. I was, a, I, I think I just made partner at the firm. I went to one of the associates who I knew loved basketball. And I said, okay, you, I will bring, I will give you two tickets to every Bullets Wizards game. Um, but you have to bring a friend, Right and obviously a female friend. And <laughs> I had a particular female friend that I was interested in her bringing. And she brought that friend. And I said, oh, wait, we got four tickets. Bring somebody else, okay? So I, I can't even tell you this whole story because it's kind of crazy, but because it's just, <laughs> we went to the game and the friend that I wanted to come to the game did, did a terrible thing at the game, terrible thing. Rooted for the Seattle Supersonics. Oh, no. <laughs> you do not go to a bullet game or wizard game now with me. And I still am a season ticket holder and root for anybody other than the Wizards. And that just hurt me to my core. And I <laughs> paid no attention to her the whole night. Then I said, OK, listen, I'm going to put your other friend on the subway and I'll drive you, the, the associate to work with me, I'll drive you and the friend I was interested in home, but the other person is getting on the subway. So um, I won't tell you the question I asked in the car. That, that, that's a little too much for this podcast, but <laughs> make a long story short, I dropped those two off and I drove the other woman clear across DC to her apartment to drop her off instead of putting her on the subway. And that woman is now Karen Pierce. <laughs> that's outstanding so you you were strategic even back then tony with respect <laughs> but, to but relationships I, I was strategic and stupid by the way because the funny part about the story too is that the associate had told the woman what i was up to right and then told karen that well look when he sees you he'll drive you home don't worry <laughs> He'll like you. <laughs> right? They were all talking about it. 
right? And the other woman had no interest in me whatsoever. And I drove Karen home and then we, and I asked her how did we, we start day. Anyway, that's, that's, that's the story. And then we had all our three wonderful daughters who are now very, very bright, very beautiful and very expensive. <laughs> <laughs> Which is what keeps you working hard. Absolutely. And that, is, that is, you know, one of my mentors, Verna Jordan was said, Tony, you know, this job is not an end in of itself. It is a means to an end. And the end is your wife and the three girls taking care of them and, and having a nice retirement um, and, and living a long life. Um, this job, do not treat this job as an end in of itself because you'll go crazy doing it. And he's exactly right. <laughs> now you've had a lot of success in the job itself on your way to uh, becoming a partner at Aiken Gump. Uh, one of your first cases involved the leaky roof of a Kmart in Springfield, Virginia, and also uh, you your first trial was on the Fuddruckers, which I believe I had actually been to on Rockville. Everybody Pike. has been to that had been to that Fuddruckers, I assure you. Yeah, what what <laughs> what what were those cases that you had to litigate? So the, you know, this was so long ago. This we're talking about thirty plus years ago. Um, so let me try to get it right. I actually have a one of my one of my wall pieces is a letter from for the the leaky roof case that I've kept all these years um, and framed. Uh, the leaky roof case was the Kmart in Springfield, Virginia. It's no longer there, but I don't know. It's the building's still there, but it but the Kmart's not. Um, it had was the roof was put on in a faulty manner, and the folks that owned it were clients of the firm, the State Teachers Retirement fund of Ohio. So, I mean, how can you, you go better than representing, you know, teacher's retirement fund, right? That's like, you know, sainthood, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> you always want to make sure the teachers have a nice retirement fund, right? Um, so, you know, I, we sued them um, for the, the, I won't say who we sued, They're, they don't need to, to know, because um, we ultimately settled the case, but we sued them. And, um, I was wonderful because I really handled the case. I was a relatively young lawyer and I really handled the case by myself. Wasn't a terrible amount of money by today's standards involved, um, but it was certainly important to the teachers. And um, um, and we had expert witnesses and we had a, we had a motion for summary judgment. Um, and we ended up forcing a settlement that I thought was, that no doubt was very favorable for the teachers. And I just kind of thought, hey, if I can do this all the time, <laughs> this, is, this is good stuff. The Fuddruckers case was a little nastier because that actually ended up in a full trial. Well, I should say a full trial, a trial that settled in the middle of the trial after the judge realized that the guy on the other side was lying out of his teeth. Um, but, um, and, 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 and then suggested that we all settle, settle the case we did. But again, that was one of the, that, that was one of the great, moments for me because I got to see a real trial lawyer, uh, a old former partner at Aiken Gump named Roxanne Sokoloff, who I learned so much trying that case with her. She literally came in a week before the trial because I said, listen, this thing's going to trial. I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> Can you help me? <laughs> and she came in and helped me get ready for the trial. And I put on several witnesses and she put on several witnesses and we just had a blast. And right out there in Montgomery County. And you probably, there's not too many people who lived in Montgomery County that ha didn't either go there as an adult or go there forced by their kids. Um, and I don't, I, don't, I don't think it's a Fuddruckers now anymore, but I'm pretty sure the building is still there. Yeah, no, it, it, was, <laughs> it, it, it was one of those places that everyone went to, but uh, it also was along the way of the many successes that you had at Aiken Gump, Tony, uh, eventually becoming partner. One of the interesting things about you is that uh, you used the access and the opportunities you got in becoming a partner to do a lot more in the community. What has driven you so much to spend so much of your time and effort trying to give back to the community? Yeah, I think it's, um, it's part of the ethos of our firm and certainly of my position 
as a partner in charge of the DC office. Um, again, I'll go back to mentors. If, if you uh, think of Bob Strauss, who founded our law firm, um, a great person who, you know, always cared about public service, served as ambassador to, to the former Soviet Union when it broke up and, and was always an advisor to all presidents on both sides, um, but a Democrat. <laughs> Um, and then Vernon, who were all who two were great mentors of mine, um, all had always infused in us, I think, a sense that we have to give back to the community. And I, it is, it is, it is part of my thinking, uh, my being, quite frankly, that any business that is in a city or region or whatever should also take some time to care about what happens in that region. Um, and not just be there to make the money and, um, and move on. Mo all our employees come from this city and region. Many of our clients are in this city and region. The very lifeblood of the city, which is the government and its function is very important to our client base and our partners individually. So it makes no sense um, for us not to do something um, to get back. And that's what prompted me to to get involved in him. our former chairman, Bruce McLean, first hooked me up with a guy named Tony Bozzelli, who you may know, who used to run Deloitte in the region. And I think Tony put me on my first, um, uh, I will say business organization board, which if I recall correctly, was the Cultural Alliance. I don't think it's in business anymore, but yes, the Cultural yeah. Alliance of, of Greater Y. And I, I went on that board and then from there, I did other things. I also make it a point to do something in the legal um, area. So I also served on the board of trustee, have served, continue to serve, and was president for a while for the Legal Aid Society um, uh, board of trustees, which is, which is one of the premier legal services providers for the poor in the city. So it's, it, it's not just business organizations that I'm also in involved in and encourage others to be involved in, but also philanthropic ones that that have some tie to your profession in some way or the other. And I know you have been really passionate about Legal Aid Society and spent a lot of time, energy and effort, whether as the president uh, of the board or continuing your support to the organization. Now, you've also been very involved in a lot of regional initiatives, uh, Tony including the um, effort that was underway a few years back to bring the Olympics to DC. Uh, and that didn't work out. But what got you involved in that bid and why didn't that uh, go anywhere? So, um, well, as Ted Leonsis would say, it was a blessing that it didn't go anywhere. <laughs> but, but, um, you know, we had been somewhat, the law firm had been somewhat involved in the early 2000s in an, in an initial effort to help bring the 2012 games here that went to London, I believe. Um, and when this came up, if I recall correctly, I got a call from someone at the Board of Trade and said, Tony, would you be willing to help out with the legal side of this effort? And I said, sure. That seems like a great thing. I mean, when you think about it, uh -huh, every major capital in the world has had the Olympics, but Washington, D.C. I mean, we've had it in communist nations, um, in very bad places that you would not want to be. You know, I mean, just I mean, Moscow's had it. Beijing's had it. Beijing's about to have it again. Um, so, you know, when you think about that, it should it it should come here in my view. And so I, and that's what was my thinking at the time. Sure. And um, I knew I knew a lot of people in the city who would care about doing it. And I knew we could certainly provide the legal background for it. So um, I helped form the Washington 2024. In fact, I think I'm the person that signed the corporate papers for it <laughs> and um, got to work with some great people. Russ Ramsey, one of the, one of the great citizens here. Um, Linda Rabbit was involved, a lot of Board of Trade, Joe Rigby, I'm, I'm putting all names that I can think of. Ted obviously was involved. Um, and we had a Sheila Johnson, 
let us use let us use her plane to fly to the <laughs> presentation that we had to do to the USOC. And I think ultimately it 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 failed because even though I think we clearly had the best bid, um, absolute best bid, um, we're going to transform part of the city and have activities throughout the entire region, Virginia, Maryland, and DC. Um, it failed ultimately because I think the USC, USOC does not understand Washington. And, and I say this to people outside of the region all the time. Everyone thinks of Washington as what I'll call the, the 535 plus one jerks. They say that, not me jerks that are running the government, right? Um, what they don't understand is that DC includes uh, Chevy Chase, <laughs> it includes my old neighborhood, River Terrace, it includes Rockville, it includes Springfield, Fairfax County, um, Prince George's County, all of the vibrancy of this region. And a lot of these people have nothing to do with the government, <laughs> right? They're real people, just like LA is a real city with, with neighborhoods and people, and Boston is a real city with neighborhoods and people. But for whatever reason, I think the USOC could not get it through its head that this would have been a great place to showcase the diversity of the country, the strength of the country. And ultimately, you know, I think they 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 screwed it up because they first picked Boston, which I think the day they announced it, there was some petition <laughs> online that got, that went rampant or, you know, viral. That's what they say, right? It went viral <laughs> against it, right? And then they quickly reneged on their, and and then the, obviously the, um, the IOC ended up splitting it with boss, I'm sorry, Paris doing 2024 and um, LA doing 2028, so. I still personally would have loved for it to have come here. And I think the, the region could have benefited from it. Um, we would have done it in a way that did not leave a bunch of, you know, white elephant facilities like has happened in so many other cities. And we would have done it in a way that I think would have grown jobs um, and influence for the region, not just in the United States, but influence around the world. But that also one of the side benefits, Tony, was some of the connections and the relationships regionally, which have also led to organizations like the Greater Washington Partnership that you are involved with. From sure. your perspective, what's the vision of what regionalism can be all about and uh, Greater Washington Partnership wants to bring about in our region? So I think the, um, you know, the partnership is a phenomenal organization the only gathering I think of true CEOs in the region. And, and when I, you know, I'm very involved in regional issues for the Board of Trade, other organizations as well, but the partnership has a broader region in my mind that runs literally from Richmond to Baltimore and it includes CEOs and influencers from all of those cities. And I think the vision, well, the, the current vision um, and I think it's the right one, is to use the diversity of this region to attract more businesses and attract and retain the talent. When you think about Washington as a region, those actually those three cities, just think about all the talent that we have here. You know, we got Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, University of Richmond, VSCU down in Richmond. We've obviously got Georgetown, GW, an American, Catholic, Howard, all the great universities that we have here. And much of our talent leaves, right? Even with that, we're still one of the most educated regions in the world. And I think one of our strengths is that unlike many others, we're a very diverse region and we need to take advantage of that. Um, and I think that's one of the things among many that the partnership um, is interested in doing it. It just happens to be one of the things I care the most about. Um, also care, obviously, and the partnerships involved in it, as well as other organizations, in attracting those businesses, 
very involved in getting Amazon to come here, which I think is going to be a, a big plus for the region. Um, but that vision about making it known that we are the most inclusive region for business, that businesses that care about inclusivity um, is, as I think is an important vision for the partnership. And the focus on talent is exactly where, Tony, I see, whether it's with my clients or the conversations with the global thought leaders and CEOs of global organizations, that has become a key differentiator, access to the best talent. Therefore, nurturing more of the talent makes this a more appealing place for more businesses to uh, want to be because that access to talent is a big competitive advantage. And even though the pandemic has made some virtual connection and relationships possible, mm -hmm. the future will require still in-person connections so that access to regional talent is really important. Now you have continued your regional involvement. One of the uh, strong roles that you played uh, both as board chair of the Greater Washington Board of Trade and initiating a review of the strategic direction of that organization, really introduced a pivot and caused for a pivot in the Board of Trade. What brought that about and how were you able to manage that, Tony? Well, my view at the time when I was chair of the Board of Trade, I, I'd either, we were just either in the middle or just start, I can't remember. Uh, I'd have to get the timing right, but I was very much involved in the Olympics when I was either just before being the chair or just after it. I can't remember the exact dates, but I'm getting old. Um, but we can, you can figure that out on your own. The, um, and what I saw is that with the Olympic bid, I saw a ton of people, some of whom were very much involved in the Board of Trade. Like I said, Joe Rigby was a past chair. Linda Rabbit was a past chair. Rosie Allen Herring was, was involved in the Olympic bid. There were a bunch of border trade people involved, but there were also a bunch that were not involved. And I thought, okay, we're a regional organization. We're 130 some years old, I believe at the time. It's certainly 125. I might, I might have my, my hundreds gone off a little bit. <laughs> um, we were an old organization that, you know, had survived many, many years, obviously. And I thought, well, maybe now we should look at what the Board of Trade is doing and how does it make itself even more relevant for the 21st century. And, um, you know, we had some great help from Terry McClements at um, PwC that helped us do a sort of, what do they call those things, SWOT analysis. Um, and we, um, we eventually came up with a plan that I think, you know, the pandemic kind of hurt, <laughs> hurt it a little bit but a plan that I think is helping to transform the border trade and make it, it's still one of the strongest organizations in the region, but continue that strength and make sure that it, it has a strong membership, a mission that focuses on regionalism, a little bit of a different region in my view than, than the Greater Washington Partnership um, and has input from all the businesses. And quite frankly, is a voice because I do think that you know, the business community has, there's so many different organizations that sometimes, you know, you don't have a, you need a single voice. I, I don't know if that's going to be the Board of Trade. It could be certainly be more than one organization, but I want the Board of Trade because of its history in the city and its expertise that it has there and Jack McDougall and others and its membership. I wanted to have a voice. Um, um, and, and that was the idea behind it. And I, I think under Jack's leadership, it really has done, has done that. I think uh, the former executive director, Jim Deniger, was wonderful on these things. But, you know, every time you need change every now and then, I think Jack has sort of taken it. And, um, and I'm hopeful that he will continue to take it up to the next, to the next level. That was a long answer, but that <laughs> it covered everything, I think. Yeah, no, I think I think uh, uh, all organizations, most especially these regional focused business organizations, do need to constantly reevaluate their value proposition and their purpose. It's been a shifting landscape for all of them. And without shifting the strategy, 
I think it doesn't matter if you're a 100-year-old organization or a 10-year-old organization, you will go out of business, uh, which, is, which is a threat for all businesses anyway. However, some of these more membership-oriented organizations didn't have to respond as quickly and be as agile. So good Correct. for you for initiating the strategic thinking and the agility that uh, I believe regional organizations, especially including the Board of Trade, need to continue to have to uh, bring additional value uh, that in many instances people seek in uh, through other means and other platforms. I think that's, that's exactly right. And I think your point about it Con being a constant focus to look at what you're doing and your strategic direction. And, and I'm happy now that I'm, I mean, I hate this word. I'm on the senior council. <laughs> <laughs> you are and not I'm a senior, <laughs> but you have been admitted to the senior council. <laughs> like, can we call this thing something else? <laughs> I'm on the senior council of all these past, uh, with all these other past board of trade um, chairs. And we are heavily involved in helping the organization continue that, um, the constant review of its direction. Now, here's an interesting thought on it though, Tony. <laughs> Sometimes I don't know about the Board of Trade, it's about other organizations that I'm involved with, I coach and guide. The people that have the hardest time imagining a new future are the people that have seen the organization success in the past so sometimes and then they think they, that we should just repeat that right exactly yeah. let's just go back to the future to, to the extent this this podcast is about leadership that is a terribly important point because I, in my view a bad leader is one well you know there's a great line did you, did you ever see the um oh what was that movie about um winston churchill and um oh god what's the name of that movie Anyway, there's a great movie, relatively recent, about I, the name will come to me about I'm a big movie guy, about Winston Churchill. And at the end of the movie, he has convinced the parliament to actually fight Hitler, right? You know, you remember Dunkirk, they almost lost the entire army and they had to send the personal watercraft to get them off. Okay, so he's now talking to parliament and he gives this great speech. Um, and at the end of it, his one of his senior people looks at him and says, so you changed your mind, huh? Because because uh, Halifax and and um, Neville Chamberlain were all telling him that he didn't negotiate with Hitler. And he's and so he gave the speech where he says, no, nope, we're going to fight in the streets to the end. Right. And he says um, that this guy says, so you changed your mind. He says, yeah. He said, people who don't change their mind never change anything. And and it's a wonderful line that I wish I could say I said it myself, because if you are in an organization and you keep thinking that the way you did it in the past is the way you should continue to do it, that organization is doomed to fail, doomed to fail. Um, it's just and there's so many I won't go through them all, but there's so many examples of that. Um, so I, I think that's a very, very good point about effective leadership. Learn to change your mind or change your strategy when the times, the environment changes with you. And now, you, while you've done this in the community, Tony, you've also had to, in addition to um, your own uh, role in the firm, you've also been managing the firm, which means you've had to have the culture stay a positive, robust culture, whether it was the 2008-2009 economic collapse or the pandemic, which has really shifted how a lot of organizations work, how a lot of people view their relationship with work. How have you been able to manage the internal culture at Aiken Gump? So one of the great things, I, I didn't tell you this, but I think I became partner in charge of the DC office September of 08. And you remember what happened in September of 08. Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers went under and everyone thought the world was going to end. Yes. And, um, you know, we were in the middle of an election. Obama and McCain were running against each other. And, um, it was crazy. And my predecessor was a wonderful guy. 
he said, I was supposed to take over officially in January. It was announced in September, but Tony, you'll become Jan. He said, Tony, you got it now. <laughs> 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 and, you know, this had never happened in the legal business, particularly big law, which is what all firms of my size consider ourselves to be. A number of big law firms laid people off. It never, that never happened. Um, and, you know, I remember thinking to myself, okay, we have to make sure that the people who are staying, you know, still think this is a vibrant place and a place where they can grow their careers. And, they, and I think that has a lot to do with culture. Um, and I think the one thing that I think defines a good culture is teamwork. And in a, any kind of professional services firm, accounting, consultants, professional services firms, almost, and I assume this is the way in, you know, in, in big corporations, whatever, but I know professional services firm, and I know that we had to act as a team. And so both in 08 and, and to this day in the pandemic, I have focused on making sure people are familiar with each other. They know what each other does. Um, my partner uh, in the office next to me, I know what his expertise is. He knows what my expertise is. I know what the expertise is of the associate down the hall. And as a team, we think about each other as a team. And so if I'm out at a client and a client has a problem that's not my expertise, I think about whose expertise it is. And I try to sell that expertise to that client because I think that client doesn't need me. That client needs one of my colleagues. And I think that infused, it, I mean, look, we don't always do it that way. Okay, there's certainly some cowboys here. <laughs> but, but by and large, we try. And I think that is what has held us together. Um, right now, put, put 2008, 2009 aside, but right now, you know, there is a lot of turnover in our business. Right. People are not people are not leaving because they hate their organizations. They're leaving because they're just rethinking their lives, particularly some of the kids. Right. And so we have to make sure that we are giving them. The 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 culture that allows them to grow so that when that hit hunter calls and they're all calling hell, even calling me and I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> You should tell them I'm on the senior council. Why are you calling me? <laughs> Why are you calling me? Um, um, you know, we say, hey, wait a minute. I'm not, I'm, I'm going to stick, to my stick to itness in the organization is about the people, right? I can always do great work at any, I mean, all of our law firms all do great work, right? We all have interesting cases, interesting deals, um, interesting regulatory issues that we face. But it's the people that make you stay at a place. And I try to make this as nice a place for the people. Um, I mean, right now, we just opened back up partially on, on Monday. And we are having more food because I found that one of the best things you can do to get people to, to hang out and communicate and get to know what's going on in each other's lives after 19 months of being apart is food. <laughs> <laughs> we have all these events happening. We have a happy hour tonight. We got it. We have breakfast on Monday. Um, so anyway, it, it to me, just to cut it down, it's all about teamwork and and making sure you know your your fellow professional services colleague um, and and that stick to itness. You, 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 you can leave a job at any moment, right? Because remember what I said earlier, when I told you one of my mentors said, this is just, this is not an ending of itself, but it's hard to leave your friends and your colleagues who you have, ha have helped you and who you have helped. And that's my concept. That's my, that's how I try to lead on the culture front. And that's a great perspective, Tony. And one of the things that that requires is some of those human interactions that I think have been minimized in the minds of some leaders and some people because the technology has served as a replacement. The technology is great. 
However, we still lack the ability to build deep relationships through the technology. There's a, a, a futurist, the smart guy, has a bunch of books on these subjects, Trond Untheim, and he had worked for Oracle for many years. And the example he gives, he says, at any point in time, I had stronger relationships with my competitors than I did with the other people at Oracle because he was remote. So there mm. is a need for those in-person connections. Absolutely. And human interaction for those relationships to exist. Otherwise, the job becomes just a task to be performed. And then right. therefore, it doesn't matter if you perform it from for uh, organization X or organization, organization y. y. Who cares, right? And, and it's important too to connect with the clients in that instance too, because again, that everybody's trying to take everybody else's clients, right? Um, your client sticks with you because of the, again, I think you, I can throw a rock out here and find a great litigator, right? But I think clients come to me because I care about them and I show interest in them and their problem. Um, there was some, you, you, you said something that triggered a, a thought of my, oh, here's the other thing. I think you, you were talking about the personal interactions. The other thing, and again, I think this is, maybe this is unique to professional service firms because it's what I know, um, but training. You cannot mentor somebody and train somebody over a Zoom. You and I know each other. We can have this conversation over a Zoom and it's okay. It would obviously been much better if we were sitting face to face with each other, but we can do this over Zoom and you can do your podcast and I think it'll be effective. You're asking great questions and I hope I'm giving you good answers but if i'm trying to tell teach somebody how to take a deposition or how to interview a witness that has to go to trial or prepare a witness for trial doing it over zoom just doesn't work the other thing i think that's important about getting people back and making sure people have that personal interaction is how many times in your business i know this happened numerous times in my business where I'm just walking down the hall and I see one of my partners and I may say, Hey, did you, you remember this case where da 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 And they say, Oh yeah, da 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 And we have in that interaction come up with a solution for a client. Right. And I'm like, Oh, that's great. I'm telling you, we don't have that anymore when you're, you know, you think about it, getting on the phone and getting on the Zoom, it's a hassle, right? But if I'm walking to the kitchen to get a cold brew from our wonderful new cafeteria, <laughs> right? <laughs> and I see a guy or a gal and I say, hey, let's talk about this. So they ask me something about that. Those things, to my view, I think a lot of people have said, okay, well, we're not going to be back full time. That's all true. I think we're you know, people are going to be more flexible. And I think that's a good thing. But I do think that that the value of those personal interactions are going to come back as soon as we can, we can get this damn thing behind us. Absolutely, uh, Tony. I mean, uh, part of the reason we can also have this conversation over Zoom and have an effective conversation is built on the fact that we have seen each other in person, shook hands, we have connected it with that humanity, and that's critical. The other element of it, which is so true, is that you can't manufacture serendipity. And there are a lot of conversations that we end up having purely based on that serendipity of two people bumping into each other. You can't manufacture that. If I yeah. say, let's schedule a Zoom call for half an hour, there has to be an intention behind it. And if there isn't, after like five minutes, you're like, why the heck are you keeping me on this thing? So there is, and I, I think it's important for leaders and for uh, people to understand that, that yes, technology has come a long way, we are really fortunate to have been able to access these technologies over the pandemic. However, there is real value from the in-person interactions. Now, Tony, you have been a magnificent leader, whether it is for your firm or in this entire regional community. Are there any leadership resources, leadership practices that you typically find yourself recommending to others? 
Well, there is, oh my goodness. I can't remember the name of the book, but there's a book. I think it's something about no random acts of lunch. You know what I'm talking about? Uh -huh. It's an orange book. Oh, I know somebody took it off my shelf when I, a couple of weeks ago. Oh God, what is that book? Anyway, it's a book that tell, and this, I, I think this is a leadership tactic that um, maybe it's even a leadership strategy. Actually, you know, it's a human life strategy. <laughs> right? And that is, Keith, that, Keith, that is, oh, go is ahead. Keith Ferrazzi's Never Eat Alone? Yeah. No. No, okay. No, it was something about, it might, anyway, in the book, it basically says, and it has a number of different examples in the book. It might be that book. It's orange. I know that much. Um, they basically, he basically makes the point that you get more out of life by doing something for others than you do focusing on yourself. And I think if you think about leadership and you approach it in a way that you as a leader are trying to do something for others, as opposed to being in it for yourself. I think that, and I, I, I talk to not just leaders, but just, you know, average associates that walk in here to get advice. Um, I think it always comes back to you when you do that. And one of the things I pride myself on is in my leadership role at the firm or in other organizations, I'm trying to think about how I can help that organization, how I can help my partners, how I can help my associates and counsel do their work better. You know, uh, uh, some people, and I am one of them, I did not go to law school to manage anybody. I went to law school <laughs> to litigate cases. <laughs> and I, I spend 80 to 90% of my time doing that, right? But the other time where I have to do leadership, I'm always trying to approach it as, what am I doing to help my partners get more business, serve clients better? What am I doing to help the council and associates do better work, grow in their careers? And I don't know if you want to, maybe that's not a leadership um, trait or a tool or whatever, but that book that I mentioned, <laughs> which is what I tell almost every associate to read, tells you that. Um, it talks, it has a great story about being a, a dinner guest and, um, oh God, I'm testing myself. Who is the woman who was married to a congressman out in California? And then she did TV. Anyway, you'll know her. Huffington? Yes, Ariana Huffington. The guy in the book talks about how she was the best dinner guest <laughs> because she would go in and she would talk to everybody about what was on their mind. You know, she wouldn't go in there and talk about herself. She would be at dinner and she'd make this great conversation and it would be, and it would be all interactive and everything. And I thought, okay, that's 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 a good thing. You want to be you always want to be a good dinner guest and being a good dinner guest is talking and asking about other people at the dinner and what they're what's going on in their lives. And then they ask you back and you get to tell great stories and it makes for a wonderful dinner. <laughs> right? So anyway, that, that's a weird example, but that was one of the things I remembered in the book about, they also, he also said that Vernon Jordan, my mentor was one of, was one of the a great dinner guests as well. Because <laughs> he's a guy was, that always focused on that, always trying to help other people. Uh, Vernon focused a lot of his effort on helping other people, being a, a great dinner guest and serving, which is exactly what you have done over the years, Tony. Again, whether it's with respect to your clients, with respect to the firm, and the many different roles you've played in the community, in service to the community. Now, I can't let you go without uh, mentioning that you are a big video game player when you get a chance <laughs> and see. you you oh, wait my like, wife thinks i get a chance too often but. <laughs> <laughs> and you like reality tv shows so you have to tell me <laughs> what are some of your favorite reality tv oh, shows my goodness. oh <laughs> i mean the reality tv shows are i think as i told you are a a way to 
when you think about what we do every day and the complex things we have to deal with and the amounts of money that are involved and all the serious stuff that happens every day and, and certainly in my job, boy, it's really good to just empty your brain and just <laughs> enjoy the misery or the, the entertainment value of these crazy people who somehow go on reality television shows. Now, I, I will tell you, I have a few that I, I cannot believe I'm going to tell you this, but I'm going to tell you this. <laughs> I have two favorites. Um, one that my wife also enjoys and one that I actually could, if, you know, sometimes you ever, you see yourself being, you, could you ever be on a reality TV show? There's one I could probably see myself being on. That one is called Below Deck. I don't know if you've ever seen it, um, but it's about the crew of a high-end yacht and the and their interaction with the guests. Now, I would not be on the crew, obviously. I would go as a guest. As a uh, guest. <laughs> yes. Yachting would be something that I that I would enjoy doing, okay? Um, and then another one, which I find hilarious to the point that I have some people here at the firm that we actually have a watch party by text as we're watching the show um, when it's, it's called Married at First Sight. So those, I'll give you those two. There are other ones that I could talk about, but um, when I'm vegging, they fit the, they fit when you just wanna, okay, I'm done with all the work. I'm done with the border trade. I'm done with the Greater Washington Partnership. <laughs> I'm done with being interviewed by you. Let's just veg out. <laughs> watch a good reality television show, play some video games. Those are good, two good, safe um, um, and rewarding pastimes. <laughs> and one of the many things that I admire and love about you, Tony, is that you don't take yourself too seriously. Oh, there no. is a time for us to focus on producing results, whether it's for our own organizations or the community. And there is a time for us not to take ourselves seriously. <laughs> laugh, enjoy this journey that is life. And I really appreciate you taking the time to share some of your leadership journey, some of the impact that you've had, whether in the firm and the community, and some of the fun parts, fun side of Tony Pierce. Thank you so much for joining the conversation on Partnering Leadership, Tony. Thank you and happy to have done it. Really appreciate it.